Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out and joining us here at the fourth concert in the Rush Hour Concert Series here in downtown Chicago at the St. James Cathedral. The series is presented by the International Music Foundation, who are passionately dedicated to providing high quality classical music performances here in Chicago for free. My name is Christina Lin. I am a program host over at WFMT here in Chicago. I was actually there earlier today at work just talking to a coworker how fabulous it is to feature new live performances on our airwaves instead of, you know, of course repeats are great as well, but it's so great to have new live performances going on in Chicago. So I'm grateful to be here and we have some fabulous and talented musicians to talk with for the next 15, 20 minutes or so. We have Eleanor Kirk, who is harpist with the Illinois Symphony Orchestra and Civic Orchestra of Chicago. We have Paul Hauer, who is violinist in the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. We have Eleanor Barch, who is concertmaster of the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra and first violinist with the Contras Quartet. We have Amy Hess, who is violist with the Lyric Opera Orchestra here in Chicago, and Nolman Zolzaya, who is principal cellist with the Illinois Symphony Orchestra. So welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being out here and talking with me. I had, I will say, I had a lot of fun reading your bios and reading all the different ensembles you guys are in. It's so cool to have all these local ensembles represented here on the stage all at once. So speaking of all the ensembles that you guys are in, how has it been to gather with your ensembles again and start rehearsing and performing for live audiences again? Uh, for me, it's been really wonderful to finally get out to making music. I mean, so often we think of music making, getting together, making music together, making music for people as, you know, food for the soul, right? And then to suddenly have that, those same actions of gathering and being together turn into something risky, turn into something deadly, it was are really hard for me to come to terms with during the pandemic. So getting back together has really just been wonderful and indescribable. That's great, that's great. I, um, I wanted to ask Eleanor, or do you go by Ellie? I just wanted to make sure, I forgot to check before we came out here. Um, you're a member of the Illinois Symphony Orchestra and the Civic Orchestra of Chicago, like I mentioned, and you've previously performed here with the Rush Hour Concert Series, and you're a native of Evanston, so you're a, a local gal. Is it, is it great to be back here at, at St. James Cathedral for the Rush Hour Concerts again? It's lovely. I, um, I first performed on this series, I think, three years ago. Um, we did a version of Chichester Psalms, um, a reduction of the original orchestration. Very nice. Um, yeah, it was, it was great. And then last summer, I did a virtual concert with my parents, who are also musicians, which is also wonderful. Very different, obviously, but um, it was great at that time last summer just to have the opportunity to play and put something, you know, something together. Um, and then now, you know, we're playing such an exciting program and to get to play with these wonderful musicians, it was really like something that I was looking forward to for a long time. So um, I'm really excited for you all to hear what we have to play today. I'm excited too. I think I speak for everyone when I say that. And you mentioned playing with your parents and I believe you and Noman both come from a musical family. And I'm just curious, how was it growing up with musicians in your family? Did you guys rehearse all the time or play, put on little perform or big performances with your family? It sounds like you guys still do that to this day. Yeah, I'll, maybe I'll start for this one. Um, yeah, we, you know, growing up, it was sort of, um, it was a blessing and a curse, I'd say, because, you know, we got to play together and we always put little performances together, which was really fun. But, um, you know, that sort of like, daughter-parent dynamic <laughs> when your dad is telling you, hey, you're a little early, you know, it's like, ah, no, I'm not. You know? I so. always wondered about that when there were like uh, different, you know, a string quartet or the Chen family quartet, they were right. here a couple weeks ago and I wondered, is it hard to have that family dynamic when you're rehearsing or get mad at each other or maybe you guys are more professional than me and my family are? <laughs> <laughs> no, certainly when, you know, when my sister and I were growing up and through high school, it was definitely a little tenuous, but we always sort of came together at the end and, um, and it was really fun, but then it's been great to play with them, you know, sort of after going away to school and coming home, and um, now it just has sort of a different, um, a different and more meaningful feel to it. So now we're very professional. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> Noma, do you want to? Yeah. 
I, I kind of have the same kind of experience as you do. Uh, my mom and my sister are violinists, and my husband is a bass player, and my other set of families are all musicians. So definitely there are a couple of intense practice sessions. Listening to I can imagine. That's not good, you know. <laughs> um, but now, obviously, we are all professionals. We don't you know, try not to get into our boundaries so much, but it's been all this nice to make music with the family members for sure. That's yeah. amazing. I uh, wanted to ask Paul, I was reading about your uh, background and just reading all the amazing places that your musical career has brought you. It was listing Greece and Singapore and China. Did you have cabin fever over the past year or so not being able to go on your musical travels as you always did beforehand? I think for about two weeks in March, I moped. I think <laughs> most of us did. Yes. And then realized we've got to make something of this. So with my f colleague and friend, Addison Tang, we kind of did a lot of virtual concerts. He started a, a festival that's going to run for uh, July 11th to August 7th called the Fulton Summer Music Academy. Oh, nice. So just kind of building that. It was all virtual last year. And I'm from Milwaukee, so working with the youth orchestra, um, worked with an orchestra, youth orchestra in California virtually as well. So just learning that there are lots of opportunities out there if you're willing to create them. Yeah, everyone kind of had to get creative and make best of the situation. And you mentioned working with the Youth Symphony in Milwaukee. Do, as you work with younger, of course, you're all young musicians yourselves, but when you're working with younger musicians, do you kind of get a look out into maybe new uh, trends in the music community? Are, are people looking to play more new music or, or different diverse composers? Can you, do you see that working with younger musicians? For sure, and also them see, taking an active part in the programming of the pieces as well. So up in Milwaukee, they're having the students be involved in picking the pieces, and we were fortunate to play um, Coincident Dances by Jessie Montgomery. Oh, wow. So that was really neat to get to play her work as well. But yes, there's definitely a new feeling in like youth and what they're going to be bringing to the world. Very cool. And um, I know, Eleanor, you play violin with a ton of really awesome uh, chamber music group. You're, you're in the Contras Quartet. You've performed with Eighth Blackbird, I believe, and the Spectral Quartet. I imagine you played a lot of new music in these different ensembles. And uh, we have a piece of music on the program the, um, by Layla Adu Gilmore. Had you played music by her? Had you heard of her music before this concert? You know, I had not played her music before, but I had heard about her. Um, this piece is fantastic. We've had a great time playing it. Um, she has a really sort of unique musical language in this, and it has made me go after more of, more of her pieces and kind of do a little research about her, and I'm eager to program more. I have a, um, I went to school up in Madison and started a chamber music festival up there, so I'm always looking for new composers and this piece has uh, certainly piqued my curiosity about her music and I um, even discovered a couple other pieces that oh, we might consider playing and, and as, as well as this one of course too. Yeah I'm excited to hear it. Um, I listened to a video of it online and it has a really cool uh, rhythmic qualities, really cool harmonic qualities. It's almost kind of percussive, the, the opening part of it I think. That's right, yeah. It has um, an, a great influence of bossa nova music, which oh, cool. um, she discovered sort of more recently in life that both she and her mother, the piece is dedicated to her mother, but um, that both she and her mother had this in common, that they were had a sort of recent love and discovery of bossa nova music, so she included all these rhythms, so you'll hear these sort of woodblock-esque rhythms with very high pizzicati in, in the strings and in the harp and um, really a, that sort of driving dance rhythm that it just makes the piece, it gives it this sort of joyous Quality. I'm excited to hear it. I, and hearing how both of you um, have started your own chamber music festival or music festivals in general, um, I was watching an interview of Layla's online and she talked about kind of wanting to bridge the gap between classical performances and or kind of expand on the idea of what a composer is and not just playing music that's in the classical music genre but maybe kind of expanding upon that and just curious if you guys were maybe looking to play more you know different genres in any performances coming up kind of expand upon that I'm not sure 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's that's kind of how we move forward in the classical world, um, is by kind of expanding and hopefully reaching sort of new audiences while still championing those classics of the repertoire that we all love. Um, I feel like this piece is like sort of bridging the gap a little bit because it has some of those really recognizable um, rhythms and melodies, but it's still bringing in a lot of new um, interesting musical elements as well. Yeah, she, she's a good composer for that because she has music that fits in a performance like this in an orchestra setting, or it also can fit sort of in a dan dance setting or a club setting almost, so it's kind of a cool uh, person to look out for to sort of expand on those, those horizons, so very cool. Um, another piece on the program is by Tchaikovsky, his Adagio Molto in E flat. He wrote it while uh, studying at the St. Petersburg Conservatory in 1863-64, what can we look out for in this piece? Do you want? <laughs> yeah, there is. I mean, it starts just with the um, the strings, and it's this really beautiful, resonant. You know, it's adagio, so um, <laughs> relaxed opening. But there's so many beautiful harmonic changes. Um, it's just I love just sitting here and listening for the first 18 bars, um, <laughs> and then the harp comes in with. Um, some moving notes, and it's it's very Tchaikovsky, you know, those sort of arpeggiated figures, um, and yeah, it's been I I didn't know about this piece before um, this program, and now I'm like, all right, I gotta get my students to play this. And, yeah, you know. I hadn't heard of it either. I was looking, I were, as I mentioned at WFMT, looking through our library for a recording of it, and we didn't have a recording, so may, it's, maybe it's just not performed all that often, but I'm excited to hear it uh, today. And before we move to talking about the WC that's also on the program, it's kind of a weekly tradition of mine now to ask about the musician's pets, and I saw that Noman has two Siberian cats, is it? I wanted to ask, how are they while you're performing at home and putting on um, performances at home? Do they like the sound of the cello? Oh yeah, they do. Um, they're mostly just uh, sleeping, you know, it's, As okay, cats it's do. not my time to take a nap while you're practicing. <laughs> yeah, they're very it. used to uh, this stuff, but whenever we, I go high up, then they wake up. Okay, that's that's not something I want to hear. But it's been very nice to have pets uh, uh, during the pandemic because they really do bring you happiness. They really do. Sure. It's going to be hard when maybe you guys hit the road and and you might not be able to spend as much time with them. But it's good to savor the moment now, right? Yes. <laughs> and as as I mentioned, we have a piece by WC his Danse sac Sacré et Danse Profane. And in English, that means sacred dance or secular or worldly dance. And around the turn of the century, a new larger harp was being invented. And uh, WC was commissioned to write a piece of music for this instrument. And it's my understanding that this doesn't exist anymore or it's no longer used. Have you ever performed or played a, a harp that this was written for? I haven't. Um, it's it's not a harp that's really made anymore or played, but you can see it in museums, and you know some big harp nerds have, have them. And I really would love to play one one day. Um, it it has you know the same basic setup as the harp I'll play today, but it actually has two sets of strings that are crossed in the middle, um, so that instead of moving foot pedals. Um, to change the pitch or move between different keys, you actually can, you know, like a piano, you have every note available to you. But um, it sounds very complicated to play. I was going to say, like, there's already I, a lot of strings yeah, on this one. One set is enough for me, so. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. Um, and Amy, I read online, you probably heard me just read the name of that piece and cringe at my French. I know you not studied... Not at all, not at all. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that you studied French and French music. Had you heard of this piece before or studied it or is WC a favorite of yours? I had heard of this piece but actually had never played it so it's been really great to dive into it. A lot of my study of French music was centered around Ravel. I did a lot of projects with a, one of my theory professors who was a Ravel scholar and you can WC, it, you can't talk about French music in the 20th century without talking about WC and just where he took music in terms of the harmonic language, in terms of the, the colors that he was able to imbue into the musical tradition at the time. So this has been really lovely to finally be able to play this piece. Yeah, I'm excited to hear it. I listened to it a little bit today and I'm like, oh, I can't wait to hear this live. I think I speak for all of us when I say that we're very excited. I appreciate you guys coming out and speaking with me about these pieces. I had a blast and we're all looking forward to hearing the music. So thank you very much. And thank you so much.
Hi everyone. Once again, my name is Christina Lin, radio host at WFMT, and here today for this Rush Hour concert as the pre-concert discussion host. I do hope you enjoyed hearing the performers discuss what they've been up to and their musical careers and the music we're about to hear. I'm uh, excited to hear the music. I'm sure you're all as well. We're going to be hearing three works for harp and string quartet. We have Alyssum, written by New Zealand composer Leila Adu Gilmore in 2014. We have Adagio Molto in E flat major by Peter Tchaikovsky, and Danse Cla a Danse, dan <laughs> sorry, my French, Danse Profonde by Claude Debussy. The International Music Foundation is grateful for support from the Claire Rush Hour Concerts exclusive media sponsor, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Illinois Arts Council. Now I'd like to welcome our talented performers to the stage, harpist Eleanor Kirk, violinists Paul Hauer and Eleanor Barch, violist Amy Hess, and cellist Noman Zolzea.